Father, uh, we just praise you tonight as our salvation, full of grace, full of truth. We thank you, Father, for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins, pouring out the wrath that we all deserve upon him. And Father, just help us tonight to understand your righteous anger and how your grace uh, mercifully brings us to our knees to restore us. Help us to see your purifying grace, but also your restorative grace. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, just real quick, some announcements. Um, we had our fellowships tonight, and uh, for those of you that your leader wasn't here, they'll reschedule those with you. Um, also, uh, BSF is now, uh, you can uh, go on and if you want to and, and enroll in next year's John study. Um, the fact of the matter is, is you're already auto-enrolled. So, <laughs> so, you know, I don't know if, I don't know why they're telling us to do that, but, uh, but you need to confirm that with your, with your group leader if you're going to attend next year. So um, I think that's all the announcements. We'll put some more announcements up here. Uh, John's Gospel is uh, next year. That's our study next year. So let's go ahead and uh, get into the lecture here. Um, I figured after this video, I probably needed a little humor. Uh, but uh, here's some clues to who you are if you are from the South, okay? You might just be a redneck if you've ever made change in the offering plate. You might just be a redneck if your lifetime goal is to own a fireworks stand. You might just be a redneck if you own a home with wheels on it and several cars without wheels. If you, if you think you're an entrepreneur because of the dirt for sale sign in your front yard. And you might be a redneck if the blue book value of your truck goes up and down depending on how much gas it has in it. <laughs> you might just be a redneck if uh, you ever cut your grass and you found a car in it. If your neighbors think you're a detective because a cop always brings you home. <laughs> so this is uh, some humor, as you guys probably know who I'm talking about. This is Jeff Foxworthy's humorous way to describe or picture a, a redneck or somebody, uh, you know, from the South. And uh, sadly, uh, I mean, many of these are, are, are funny misconceptions, not true pictures, but sadly many are, right? Uh, but let me ask you something. Let's, let's get serious for a minute. How do you picture God? How do you picture God? His character. His nature. You know, in our lesson tonight, Micah presents the true picture of God. The Almighty Lord who, on one hand, hates sin, and at the same time, loves the sinner. God's hatred of sin is real. It's burning, it's consuming, and it's destroying. He hates sin, and He stands as the, as the righteous judge ready to mete out punish, just punishment to all who defy his rule. And at the same time, at the same time, God is lovingly jealous. I love those two words together, right? Lovingly jealous for our devotion. He's not apathetic. His jealous love is real. And it's so real that he sent his son, his one and only son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, to save, uh, and, uh, to save and accept judgment in the sinner's place. So God's love and hate are together, right? Both. Both of them are unending. Both of them are irresistible. Both of them are unfathomable. And as we unpack Micah and Zephaniah tonight, uh, 
um, I want you to be sure to catch a glimpse of God's anger in action as he judges and punishes sin. But also, God is willing to pardon sin. We're going to see God's love in action as he offers eternal life uh, to all who repent and believe. He's willing to pardon the sins of anyone who repents and turns to him. And then I want you to make sure that you are part, you are a part of the faithful remnant of God's people who live according to his will. So my aim tonight, this is what the main truth I want you to walk away with tonight is this, is that we would all know and understand and learn that God exercises purifying wrath against sin, but offers a restorative grace to those who seek him. God exercises purifying wrath against sin, but offers restorative grace to those who seek him. Our focus verses tonight are uh, Nahum uh, and Zephaniah. So Nahum 1, 7 through 8, and I'll go ahead and read that, our focus verse. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the darkness. And then if we turn to Zephaniah 2, 3, our focus verse is, Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. So in our lesson tonight, we see two prophecies, two prophecies that involved a subject that we feel uncomfortable with and don't really like to think about. God's wrath, his anger and his judgment against sin, willful disobedience, rebellion against his control or apathy. And I think this is, this is probably one of the most difficult biblical doctrines to accept, his wrath. Our world's chaos and, and cruelty can lull us, uh, can lull people into thinking that God doesn't care. If there is a God, would evil, uh, why is evil abounding and why is it going unchecked? Wouldn't a loving God intervene? Despite this thinking, uh, this difficulty, the Bible is very clear. The Old Testament and the New Testament affirm that sin brings wrath from which we must be saved. The Bible's clear on that. Ultimately, God will settle all accounts. If the wrath of a human can be scary, then what is the wrath of God going to do to a person? Let that sink in just a minute. Webster defines wrath as strong, vengeful anger or indignation. Retributory punishment for an offense or a crime. Divine chastisement. So the first thing that I think we... First fact I think we learned from this is that we see, we see here is that God's wrath is justified, right? His wrath is justified. The punishment or wrath fits the crime. We always want to talk about God's love and His mercy and His grace, which are wonderful things, but what about His wrath? What about his wrath? That's our, that's our doctrine tonight. I'd rather discuss God's love than his wrath. We want to think that God is a God of love, not wrath and anger. It's too divisive. It's controversial. And you often hear, that's just, just not loving. God's just not loving. God's apathetic. Well, think about this. Pitting God's love against God's wrath is as common these days as the biblical illiteracy which feeds such a sentiment. 
Yes, God is love. He is love. He's a God of love. But because He is righteous and pure and holy and sinless, He's a God who hates sin. And because of this, He must judge sin. He must pour out His wrath and righteous anger against all sin and those who reject Him. And we can say, like the person who serves the time for a crime, that justice is served. He is righteous and just in all, in all that He does. And He will never pour out His wrath on those who don't deserve it. Those who choose, on the other hand, to reject Him, His Son, and receive His salvation for sin, those who reject Jesus who died for their sin, will receive their choice. Just punishment and wrath for their choice. There are two, two New Testament passages that I think uh, go along with uh, this lesson and give us clues into truly understanding God's wrath. Uh, uh, and those are Romans 1.18. The first one, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And then you have Romans 2, 5, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, and that's the key word, unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when His righteous judgment will be revealed. When His righteous judgment will be revealed. Not if. Not if. Now those who humble themselves before Him and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, those who have a genuine personal relationship with Him, believing Jesus died for their sins, they will have eternal life and the blessings and God's favor. They will call him Abba Father as his holy children. John 3.36 speaks of this. Whoever, whosoever believes in the Son, Jesus, has, present tense, has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. So as we get into our first division, uh, Nahum, two divisions, Nahum and Zephaniah tonight, uh, we see that, that Nahum prophesied God's wrath and judgment against Nineveh and his comfort to Judah. So let's just talk about Nahum a little bit. Nahum uh, was written in pretty much at the zenith of this wicked and cruel Nineveh, a serious power, okay? Approximately 100 years after Jonah, a hundred years after Jonah and 50 years before uh, Nineveh was destroyed in 612 by the Medes. This was the fulfillment of the prophet Nahum's prediction probably during Josiah's reign. Remember King Josiah? During his reign that God would completely destroy the city. And we read in, in Nahum 1, we see uh, what God says about himself here. Uh, let's read in, in 1, 1 through 3. An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, uh, the Elkishite. The Lord's anger against Nineveh. The Lord is jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemies. The, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of His feet. And then we see in verse 6, if we go to verse 6, kind of a rhetorical question. Who can withstand His judgment? Talking about God's, uh, or God's in, in indignation. Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. And then if we move on a little further, in, uh, we see God's final verdict in 8, uh, eight through uh, 15. 
But an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the darkness. Um, we see his final verdict there. So remember, when we study Jonah, remember when we st study Jonah and God's call, uh, called him to go and preach repentance to uh, the Ninevites? Well, the Ninevites then believed in God, didn't they? They repented, Scripture tells us. There was this great revival. And now it's been a hundred years. It's been a hundred years, and things have changed. Things have changed. God spared the, uh, the, the Nineveh of Jonah's day, but the Nineveh of Nahum's day rejected an opportunity they had to, to repent. Keep in mind also that God had used Assyria to judge Israel's sins and rejection of himself and take them into captivity. But now, okay, he's going to judge. He's going to judge Nineveh. A hundred years, that was all between those two. See how far they have fallen in a hundred years, right? You see some things in our country that have fallen in a hundred years, right? Gotten worse in a hundred years. But now we see in chapter 2, the Lord will restore Jacob and Judah like Israel. Why did God judge Nineveh so harshly? Did you ever, did you ever stop to consider why he judged them so harshly as recorded in Nahum? Uh, if, if he was the one who chose them as his instrument of judgment, why would he judge them so harshly? Because Nineveh had long been an enemy of Judah and Israel, God's people. We read uh, in, in 3 1, chapter 3 1, Nineveh was a, was a city of violence, brutality um, of those they conquered. They were just brutal to those that they conquered. They amputated hands and feet. If you read about, uh, about uh, these Assyrians, they ha amputated hands and feet. They gouged out the eyes. They would skin and impale uh, their captives. They just took it far, far beyond what uh, God had intended. And I think another reason was its extreme pride impl implied in Nahum 3.8. Perhaps due to its wealth and power, they had a water system containing the oldest aqueduct in history. And as mighty uh, militarily as they were, they were no match for the God of heaven, were they? So it's interesting also that Nineveh's destruction was hidden to the world for some time until 1842. In 1842, a modern archaeologists discovered, rediscovered its location in modern-day Iraq. So we see Nineveh's prophesied destruction vividly described and fulfilled just as the Lord had said. We also see God predict a future time of peace in, in 1, 115. And we can, we can read that. He says, Look there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, O Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you they will be completely uh, destroyed. So we do see a future time of peace that's being predicted here. It's not all gloom and doom, right? Again, in verses 9 through 14, we see the focus on God's anger against Nineveh and his plans. The destruction of Nineveh by the Babylonians would be good news for Judah, right? Good news for them. Why? Because they would be rid of one of its most dangerous enemies. In addition, the Hebrew noun, tra uh, noun translated peace in Nahum 115 is sometimes used in reference to deliverance or freedom from enemy attack. So this peace, this peace connects with the destruction of an enemy. 
God's word never changes. We see that in Psalm 119, 89. That was in your, uh, in your questions this week. So the book of Nahum ends with a rhetorical question regarding the reason for Nineveh's coming destruction. And we read that in 3, uh, 19. Nothing can heal your wound. Your injury is fatal. Everyone who hears the news about you claps his hands at your fall. For who has not felt your endless cruelty? This phrase indicates that Nineveh's sin was unforgivable. Does this principle apply to individuals? Is our sin unforgivable? Is there a point at which we can no longer be forgiven or saved? No. God always offers forgiveness to those who will ask of Him. We see that in Isaiah 118 and 1 John 189. It's those who claim to be sinless or refuse to ask for forgiveness who miss out on God's cleansing and salvation. The only point at which it's too late to be forgiven is the point of death. We find that in Hebrews 9.27. Hebrews 9.27 says, Just as a man is destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. Unbelievers who have rejected God's offer of forgiveness will have no more opportunities to change their minds. Their eternal destiny will be set and done. And here I would suggest that God is stressing the certainty of not only their demise, but also of Nineveh, of Nineveh's demise. Nineveh, just like uh, those that reject Christ, reject his salvation, they'll reap what, they, what they've sown, right? But there's something else that I want you to see here. Something else that I want you to see here. The contrast between God's firmness and judgment and vengeance on his enemies and his tender care for his own people. Let's, let's go back to 1, to chapter 1 again. Verse 7. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. And then we see in chapter 2, verse 2. The Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel. Those, though destroyers have laid them waste and have ruined their vines. And what that says to me and, that, and hopefully says to you is that we can find comfort and peace balancing God's wrathful judgment and His love and the, and the, the, the good of his salvation because he is just he is righteous he will always do the right thing he will judge sin and rejection of himself and yet at the same time he will bless those who love him and obey him those who have been called into fellowship with him and born again by his spirit so what can we surmise here from this that God's character is consistent. He's a holy God. He loves good and he hates sin. He rewards good. And he judges and punishes sin. This should give you and I confidence and hope that one day God will wipe out all sin, all sin, because he is holy and just. And so my first principle um, that I want you to walk away with tonight is this. God exercises just wrath against sin as an expression of his purifying, protective love. God exercises just wrath against sin as an expression of his purifying love, protective love. I think another way to say this is God's righteous, just wrath 
burns against all that threatens what his perfect love protects. His righteous, just wrath burns against all that threatens what his perfect love protects. You, th you, see, you see the human trafficking that's going on in our country, around the world. You see how Hillsborough County, Polk County, you see where the Sheriff's Department are cracking down and they're, 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 they're weeding these human traffickers out. Okay, this, this to me illustrates God's protective love. Yeah, they're, they're uh, being wrathful against these human, tra human traffickers, right? But it's, it's out of protective love for these, th those that are being trafficked, right? Those in this fight, because they hate it, just like God hates sin. And they're going after them, and they're convicting them, and uh, arresting them, which is a good thing. God is a jealous God. His desire to avenge evil rises from his deep love for his people and his holy hatred of sin. And in this judgment of Assyria and its capital Nineveh, holy God is judging a sinful world. And so his wrath, his wrath truly is an expression of his love and protection. And what I want you to pay attention to in this lesson is your relationship or lack of relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. How does this apply to me personally, to you personally? I want you to pay attention to the wrath of God in response to you, to your sin, to man's sin. And so a logical question might be, is this justified, a just response on the part of God? The short answer is yes. God stands at the, as the righteous judge of all mankind. Each of us will have to give an account of what we've done and how we lived. Each choice, each decision we make has consequences. And what many people often struggle with is marrying the idea that God can be love, and at the same time, God can extract this wrath. This wrath. How can these two coexist together? Well, I think from the very beginning, God established a principle. And the principle, he told Adam, the day you eat from that tree, you'll surely die. When God judges sin or responds to wrath to sin, he's doing so to uphold the principles or the laws that he established. Without them, instead of order, we would have chaos, wouldn't we? But the beauty of God's principles are that they don't just apply to judgment. Because of his principles, God honors his promises also. His principles are why we, he responds when we put our trust in Jesus for salvation. His principles are why we experience His grace and His mercy and His favor and answered prayer. Yet it's also the same reason a person can potentially experience His wrath. Because He's loving, He's fair, and He's just. From the same exact throne flows the love of God and the justice of God. We get to decide which one we'll experience. So my next question is this to you. How does God's wrath impact you? How does God's wrath impact you? What do you do with God's judgment? What do we do with God's judgment? Anyone who remains arrogant and resists God's authority will face his anger. Even in pouring out his judgment, God has given us a choice. We see God's wrath in Christ like we saw here on the, on the video, in Christ's great work on the cross, by sending His Son Jesus and pouring out His wrath, which you and I deserved, on Him and His will and plan was, that was being accomplished. 
His wrath upon Jesus was an expression of his love for you and for me. So here's the choice that remains for all of us. You can accept Christ Jesus as your substitution and in him find the complete judgment of your sin paid in full, or you can choose to pay the price yourself and suffer God's wrath. One way or the other, the justice and judgment of God for sin will be fulfilled. God alone, God alone can truly rescue you, save you, and free you from fear. God's love and mercy allows you to not have to pay that penalty for your sin because Christ has paid it for you. Here again, we see God's justice and wrath, but we also see completely God's love and action. God exercises just wrath against sin as an expression, again, of his purifying, protective love. C.S. Lewis wrote this, No doubt, pain as God's megaphone is a terrible instrument. It may lead to final and unrepented rebellion, but it gives the only opportunity the bad man can have for amendment. It removes the veil and it plants the flag of truth within the fortress of a rebel soul. Where do you stand with God, with Jesus? Have you rejected him as your savior and still remain under his wrath for your sin? Or have you received him as your savior and experience his love and his mercy and his grace? and forgiveness for your sins? How maybe has your sin lulled you into an apathetic view of God and others? How are you possibly dismissing the image of God in those you find difficult to love? And how does God's promise to bring justice to the world offer you hope, offer you hope? Well, our second division is Zephaniah, where God, uh, Zephaniah prophesied God's judgment and the restoration of God's exiled people. Um, we see the prophet Zephaniah um, prophesying this judgment on Judah and surrounding nations, uh, Philistia, Moab, Ammon, Cush, and Assyria. Yet, he also promised restoration of the remnant. And that's kind of a key word through all of this, through Zephaniah, is uh, restoration of a remnant within Israel. So Zephaniah becomes a prophet when Josiah became king of Judah about 23 years after Nahum. When Josiah was attempting to uh, reverse the evil trends set by the two previous kings of Judah, Manasseh and Ammon, and, and his prophecy may have been a motivating factor in Josiah's reform. We know Assyria was wiped out in 612 B.C. by the Babylonians, who would become the next world power. To predict the destruction of Nineveh 10 years before it happened would be equivalent to predicting the, the destruction of Tokyo, Moscow, or New York. He warned the people of Judah that if they refused to repent, the entire nation, the entire nation, including the beloved city of Jerusalem, would be lost. And the people knew that God would eventually bless them. But Zephaniah, he made it clear. He made it clear that there would be judgment first and then blessing. Judgment, then blessing. God's judgment would be, not be merely punishment for sin, but look at it this way. It would be a process of purifying and restoring the people. Most likely, um, Zephaniah was written near the end of his ministry when Josiah's great reforms began. Assyria, again, was declining rapidly, and Zephaniah's prophecy may have been the mo uh, motivating factors, like I said, in his reform. He was also, Zephaniah was a contemporary of Jeremiah, Jeremiah, which we're going to study. He was also the great, great, great grandson of King Hezekiah of Judah. 
whom we remember was dedicated to God and to the spiritual progress of the nation, both Israel and Judah. We know that even in the darkest days, in the evilest of times, God always has a remnant of believers who submit to him, who trust him, and follow him. And he has a plan for them, just like he has a plan for, for you and I. And he also has a plan for uh, wicked unbelievers also. So our key verse, we read that, Zephaniah 2, 3. We know that God's people needed hope. They needed hope. In the midst of this terrible pronouncement, there is hope. There is hope. Hope is, is just knowing God and, and resting in his love. That's what hope is to me. Just knowing God and resting in his love and his sovereignty, right? Yet he clearly articulated God's truth of certain judgment and punishment for all who would defy the Lord. And the first chapter, if you look at the first chapter of Zephaniah, it's filled with terror. Terror. <laughs> the day of the Lord's wrath. We read in, in Zephaniah 1.4, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all who live in Jerusalem. I will cut off from this place every remnant of, of Baal, the names of the pagan and the uh, idolat idolatrous priest. And then in 6 and 7, those who turn back from following the Lord and neither seek the Lord nor inquire of him, be silent before the sovereign Lord. For the day of the Lord is near. The day of the Lord is near. And then... God will expose all fraud, he says. He will expose the spiritually stagnant and indifferent. We see so many today that are stagnant. Believers even that are stagnant and indifferent. We read that in 14, uh, 14 through 18. The great day of the Lord is near and coming quickly. The cry of the day of the Lord will be bitter. The shouting of the warrior here. The day will be a day of wrath, distress, anguish, trouble, ruin, darkness, gloom, cloudness, uh, clouds and blackness. A day of trumpet and battle cry. I will bring distress on the people and they will walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. In chapter 2, we see a whispered promise, don't we? A whispered promise in 2-3. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land. You who do what he commands, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. So here we see God's call of repentance for hope, right? And finally in chapter 3, after predicting the destruction of the surrounding nations, Zephaniah returns to the problem at hand, Jerusalem's sin, Jerusalem's sin. The future of Jerusalem, its downfall and this outpouring of God's wrath, which is worldwide in scope. We see in 2 chapter 8, I have heard the insults of Moab and the taunts of the Ammonites who insulted my people and made threats against their land. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, surely Moab will become like Sodom and the Ammonites like Gomorrah. We also see a declaration of God's salvation and deliverance for those who are faithful to him, his remnant, to those whom God would restore to the land. His promise, his promise to save a remnant, okay? That original covenant with Abraham, right? And then we read in 3, 14 and 15, that true hope, true hope. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart. O daughter of Israel, the Lord has taken away your punishment. Wow. He has taken, he has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. True hope grounded in the knowledge of God's justice and in his love for his people. You know, as, as we all read the words of Zephaniah, we, 
and we listen carefully to these words of judgment, that God doesn't take sin lightly. Sin will be punished. But I want you to be encouraged by the words of hope as God reigns supreme and He will rescue His own. He has provided salvation for those who turn to Him, for those who trust in His Son, Jesus Christ. And so my second principle is this for tonight. God exercises just wrath against sin, but He offers salvation to those who turn to Him. He exercises just wrath against sin, but He offers salvation to those who turn to Him. Men, this is the heart of the gospel, isn't it? It's the heart of the gospel. The truth of God's Word shouts this important message. God's plan for mankind is holy and perfect. And I think sometimes the lie that we often follow because we're bent, we're bent towards self-reliance is that I, I can fix everything. Man can restore <laughs> all things. But only God, only God is sovereign and only He can restore all things. He's provided a way to gain divine favor, repentance, which turns God's wrath away from the sinner. And to be certain, a day will come, the day of the Lord, when God, as judge, will s severely punish all persons, all nations for their sin and their rebellion and their rejection of Him and of His Son, uh, Jesus. We will all be judged for our disobedience to God, but if we remain faithful to Him, He will show us mercy. And as we see in Micah 7, uh, from last week, God not only forgives sins and removes wrath, but He also advocate, advocates for the salvation of His people on the basis of His mercy and His promises. And I think as we see at the cross, just like in our animated video, at the cross is where we see the full fullness of God's justice and mercy in that Christ not only became our lawyer, our mediator, and our advocate, but also our atonement, our payment, the payment for our sin and redemption. And this is exactly where God's wrath and love intersect at the cross, right? Someone had to suffer because of the debt incurred, and therefore Jesus became sin for us so that we can have eternal salvation and escape God's wrath. Imagine you're appearing in court for going 30 miles an hour over the speed limit in a school zone. I looked this up. In Florida, your fine would be between $555 and $588, okay? 30 miles over the speed limit in the school zone. And imagine that you're guilty. You're guilty. You have no recourse but to cough up the money, pay the fine. But unexpectedly, a man, an unknown man, walks into the room and he calls out to the judge, Your Honor, I, I, I'm, I'm going to pay this man's fine, this man's debt for him. Please allow him to go free. This is what Jesus did for you and for me. As our advocate, as our advocate, he took upon himself the just wrath of God that you and I deserve, and he paid the fine, the penalty for sin, which was death so that when we humbly turn to Him in faith and repentance, we receive eternal and everlasting salvation, thereby removing God's wrath on us. Have you decided to be a part of that faithful remnant of souls who humbly worship and obey God? How does the fact that God exercises just wrath against sin 
cause you to appreciate your salvation in Christ Jesus all the more. When have you experienced God's judgment of and purifying of your sin? Because we all sin. But the thing He wants to do is restore us with His grace to purify us. Purify us. I think as we close, uh, <laughs> that's a heavy lesson, right? It's a heavy lesson. So much judgment, so much judgment, so, but yet so much love and hope from God. For the believer, how we view conviction and judgment of our sin is critically important. In the end, no person will be able to hide, hide from God's ju judgment. Just like Israel and Judah, God's conviction and judgment for all. Your sin, my sin, is not merely punishment for sin, but it's also, think about it, it's a purifying process. It's purifying us. And Lord, help us to learn that tonight. Help us to learn that lesson tonight. Like Israel and Judah, though we live in a fallen world, surrounded by evil, we can hope in the future. We can hope in that perfect kingdom of God to come. We can allow any punishment that touches us now to purify us from that sin. We can seek the Lord. We can humble ourselves before Him. And we can allow His Word, His purifying, protective Word, to change our hearts and our lives. Let's pray. Dear God, uh, as Nahum wrote, you are good and a refuge in times of trouble. God, you care for us so much. We praise you as our perfect, righteous, holy God, judge and Savior. Your word tells us that you hate sin and you don't take sin lightly. And we acknowledge that you will one day exercise your wrath and avenge all sin and bring about justice the great day of the Lord. And we admit that we are sinners and deserve the penalty for our sin, death, physical as well as spiritual death. But Father, at the same time, we praise you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place as our Savior so that we don't have to suffer the penalty of our sin. We place our full confidence in you alone for eternal salvation and deliverance from sin. God, uh, do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes to pursue us of our sin to, and to purge us of our sin, to draw us back to you, to purify us and restore us. And may we remain faithful to you, a remnant, your people. Thank you for the hope that we have in you, that we, like Nahum and Zephaniah, will be voices who proclaim the good news and this hope to others. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. See you next week, men.